As I said in Sunday school, I've really been looking forward to being here. Jeff and Sally are longtime friends, and I prize their friendship and greatly prize Dr. Lohman's pastoral and preaching ministry. He and Steve Justly are two men I admire and esteem because of their love for the Lord and their faithfulness to his word. I want to read now a, a passage of scripture so we get the feel of it and then ask you to focus your attention with me for a little while this morning on one verse with no attempt to take the verse apart, rather to ask that we sit at this feast and feed on its central truth. <clears throat> The passage is what is actually the Lord's Prayer, John 17, the prayer that we know that Jesus prayed. I want to remind you of when he prays this. It is on the eve of his betrayal and his crucifixion. <clears throat> and he is expressing to his Father the things that are most on his heart. It, it's said that what people say when they are about to die is of extraordinary importance because they focus on the things that are important to them. Well, we eavesdrop on the Lord Jesus Christ entering into his closet, shutting the door, and praying to Abba, and we hear what is most important to the Savior. Hear God's word. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all to whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you've given me to do. Now, Father... Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I've manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, 
so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I stand before an immensity here that is so beyond my ability to handle in a profitable way. And yet it is a truth we need not merely to hear and acknowledge but to grasp and to be grasped by a truth to focus on as we think of who and what we are. Fill us afresh with your spirit. As lightning fell and consumed Elijah's offering, grant that the lightning of grace might fall upon us, consuming us in a holy sense, making us lost in wonder, love, and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. About 30 years ago, <clears throat> a man named Ed Farrell, who lived in Chicago, flew from Chicago to Ireland to celebrate with his uncle Seamus, Seamus's 80th birthday. Farrell got there. The big day came. They started with a hearty breakfast, and then they went to spend some time at the beach at Lake Killarney. <clears throat> Everything was emerald green. The waters were blue as the sky on a glorious March day in the south, which is unlike glorious March days anywhere else. They sat for about 20 minutes, savoring the splendor, <clears throat> when all of a sudden Uncle Seamus got up and began skipping along the beach, happy, merry as a lark. <clears throat> Farrell wasn't used to this type of conduct from an 80-year-old, so he gets up and he runs like a football player running what used to be called suicides, trying to catch up with Seamus. And he gets there, and Farrell's out of breath. He says, Uncle Seamus, what's... What's going on? And Seamus looks at him and says, My father loves me. Ah, my father loves me very, very much. My father's very, very fond of me. Can you say that? You are a Christian, right? Is your basic understanding of who and what you are this thought that the Father Almighty, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who spoke the worlds into being and who upholds them, He is very, very fond of you. How fond, you ask? I would not dare say this to you, did I not find it in God's Word. So I want you to look again at the 23rd verse, and I want you to eavesdrop on what Jesus says about every single believer in Him. Not just the famous not just the John Calvins and the John Wesleys and the Charles Spurgeons, the movers and shakers in Christianity, the one whose books we buy and whom we quote, but the ordinary, unnamed believers, people like Charlie Chase. When I die, the New York Times is not going to print my obituary. By the way, I'm pretty grateful for that. 
I am not famous, I am not well known, but I, along with Calvin and Wesley and Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones and John Piper, and John, I am included in this 23rd verse when Jesus says, Father, I want the world to know that you love my followers exactly the way you love me. We don't believe that. Because if we did, we would outshout and outsing and outdance our charismatic brothers and sisters. Frankly, you're going to be doing that in heaven <laughs> because you will understand it. The Father loves you as much as He loves Jesus. Now, we're talking about grace-focused optimism, about the thought that we are to be optimistic about God. Optimistic about God in the sense that we believe that God is always up to our good, that His answer to every why, even the whys that we ask when we are in deep and searing pain, His answer is, I am doing this because I love you. Those whom the Lord loves, He scourges and chastens every child whom He receives. So the Father says, I am always, always, always handling you with love. That is what ought to give us optimism, that we can look at anything that's going on and say, you are in my life because the Father who loves me has allowed you to come. We can say with Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God means it for good. That's what we ought to be like as we think about ourselves. That's the attitude of optimism that we ought to have. That's the meaning of grace, that God in love is always up to our good. But you will not live as the grace-focused optimist God wants you to be. Listen now, until you cultivate the habit of focusing on grace. That's all I want to do this morning. I want to give you one truth to begin focusing on. One fruit plucked from the tree of grace. One dish from the feast of grace for you to think about and talk about and pray about and share over and over and over with your brothers and sisters. And that's this one truth that your father is very, very fond of you. He loves you as much as he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants you to focus on that from the time you get up until the time you go to bed. So here's what we're going to do. I want to show you what it means, first of all, for the Father to love you the way He loves Jesus. And I have nine or ten things I want to say. Don't worry about remembering. I'll just get one or two. I'm like the preacher, Richard Baxter, who was preaching, and he said, now in the 99th place, and somebody who wrote about preaching said, as if his congregation remembered the first 98 points. Well, I'm not expecting you to remember everything, okay? But get something here. Get something that you can take. Get a doggy bag, a spiritual mental doggy bag, and put it, and take it with you, and put it in the microwave of reflection, and think about it, and feast on it over and over and over again. So here are the things. If I remember them, if I don't, we're going to assume God wanted me to forget. Okay? So let's begin. The Father loves you as much as He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means this, that just as the Father loved Jesus eternally, so He has loved you from all eternity. When I went to Belhaven College in 1964, I went on a basketball scholarship, and I, I wasn't the, just the tame, quiet, gentle guy you see up here right now. I, I was as cocky as I could possibly be. I thought I was better than Pete Maravich. I wore sunglasses at night and shoes without socks, the old penny loafers. And an example of my demeanor is when I first saw Sue West, the woman I have been married to for 50 years. She came walking in to register for Belhaven University my sophomore year. And I asked someone, who is that? And the answer I got was, this is Sue West. And I turned and I quote and said, I'm going to show you how the West was won. 
Yep, that's, she does the same thing. I did not love Sue before I saw her. I think it was a case of love on sight. But my love did not exist until a period in time. And that is not the way the Father loves the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father's love for Jesus is not a sun that gradually rose. The Father's love for Jesus was a noonday sun that shone brilliantly for all eternity. If you sit here as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father God has loved you in exactly the same way. That's what that word foreknown means in Romans 8. For those whom He foreknew. New is the rich biblical synonym for a profound and passionate love. And the for simply says, it has always been there. So that, will you listen? God brought you into existence for one reason and one reason alone, and that is that He might get glory from you by being good to you by loving you. You are not the child sired by a father named evolution and a mother named chance. You have been brought into existence from conception to this very moment, going all the way into eternity, for one reason and one reason alone, because your Father loves you and longs with the depths of His heart to make you know how deeply and profoundly and eternally He has loved you. Now, if that doesn't make you an optimist, you're in trouble. Your Father loves you eternally. Secondly, your Father loves you the way He loves Jesus because He loves you intensely. I don't know if you've ever heard of Catherine of Sierra. Catherine of Sierra is one, I think, of two women who have been given the honorary title doctor in the Roman Catholic Church. It, it, it's quite an honor. Catherine said about the Father, He is Pazzo di Amor. He is Ebro Diamor. Now that's Cajun Spanish, so you're just going to have to take it as it comes. He is drunk with love. He is crazy with love. Now, we hear that and we shrink the way we would if we were walking in the woods and we heard a rattle and we looked up and there's a 10-foot rattlesnake, head cocked, ready to strike. It sounds like blasphemy to us. The Father is drunk with love. The Father is crazy with love. In other words, the Father is consumed with love. But you cannot find a metaphor strong enough to communicate how much the Father loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed, particularly in the Gospel of John, that Jesus talks about His Father's love over and over and over. And He knows the intensity of that love. He loves you that much. Husbands, He loves you more than you love your wife. Wives, He loves you more than you love your children. Scripture uses the rich word jealousy to speak of God's love for His people. The spirit that dwells within us is jealous for us. What is jealousy? It is that love-soaked desire of a man or a woman for a spouse that you give me alone your affections. That is profoundly disturbed when interfered with. God says, I'm jealous. I love you so much, I am jealous for your heart. And I won't share it with anyone else. He loves you more than you love your children. That may be more than you love your spouse in many cases. He loves you so intensely that it's virtually indescribable. Now, do you believe that? Come on, now, we in church. Do you believe that? You're talking about igniting your passion for God. What ignites passion for God? We love Him. Because He first loved us. 
You allow the love of God for you in Jesus Christ to get hold of your heart. You believe it. And it's going to turn you inside out. And it's going to transform your life. And it's going to make you a godly man or a godly woman. So, how does the Father love you? He loves you the way He loves Jesus. What does that mean? It means He loves you eternally. And it also means that He loves you intensely. And then the third thing it means this. He loves you responsibly. The 23rd Psalm... Favorite psalm. Everyone knows the 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. We know it. It has become part of our spiritual DNA. It's, it's part of us. What is the point of that metaphor? The point is this. A shepherd was responsible for the total well-being of the sheep. A shepherd was the one who cared for the sheep from start to finish, who provided, who protected, who preserved the sheep. The Father does that with the Lord Jesus Christ, does He not? Jesus comes into this world and the Father says, I assume full responsibility for everything that's going on with you. I give you my spirit without measure. And then Jesus says, the Father hears me always. What's going on? Jesus is saying, my Father is taking care of me. And it's the same for you. You say, Charlie, give me an example. L let me give you one that we rarely think about. And just one in the interest of time. Again, I I'm just trying to get you interested in grace-focused optimism. How does God show you that He has assumed responsibility for you? Let me ask you this. Who took care of you from your conception to your conversion? Who kept you from sinning the sin unto death? You ever thought about that? Thousands have fallen on your right hand and on your left hand. They've sinned that sin, whatever it is, that is unto death, and God shuts the door and locks it and says, I'm never going to open it up for you again. But you didn't. Why not? Because your Father loved you, and He assumed responsibility for you. What kept you from Pharaoh-like hardening your heart? The first time I ever really heard the gospel, I was dating a girl in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I was in the 11th grade. Her parents were Baptists. They loved Billy Graham. And I, I had no clue what Billy Graham was talking about. I go to Bellhaven University. There's a guy named Johnny Benzel. He witnessed to me so much, I finally, in a rage, told him, don't you ever talk to me again. But what kept my heart from becoming so hard that the gospel hit it and bounced off like rain on a tin roof? What kept yours? The Father loved you and had assumed responsibility for you and has enormous and extraordinary plans for you. You see, He has assumed full responsibility for you. And then He kept you from dying in your sin. My best friend in high school, one of my best friends, died when we were in the 11th grade in a tragic football accident. And I have often looked back and asked, why you and not me? And the answer is, the Father who loves me preserved me. Then let me ask you this. Who brought Christ to you? Somebody caused the gospel good news to be thrown in your driveway. Who was it? Why? Because He loves you. Who brought you to Christ? Oh, you've been well trained. You know you don't have a little sticker on your chariot that says, I found it. Your sticker says, He found me, doesn't it? No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Thousands hear the Gospel. Thousands never hear the Gospel. Thousands never come to Jesus Christ. But you have come. Why? Because your Father's assumed full responsibility for you. And He's drawn. The very fact that you sit here as a Christian is God saying to you, I love you as much as I love the Lord Jesus. Then the Father loves you the way He loves the Lord Jesus, openly, openly. Some fathers are of the tribe that... Hey, fathers. You, you can't get any positive emotion out of them. You bring home a report card that has four A's and one B minus, and it's as though the four A's don't exist. It's the B minus that's put into the spotlight. And they never look at their children and say, Son, daughter, I love you passionately, and I love you profoundly. But the Father did that with Jesus. He's baptized. This is my beloved Son. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. The father is open and diffusive in his expression of love for Jesus. And he's done the same with you. You say, what are you talking about, Charlie? 
What is the greatest valentine in human history? You know what it is? When I behold the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son as the propitiation for our sins. God says, whenever you begin to doubt how intensely and passionately I love you, go and stand at the cross. The great Princeton founder, Alexander, Archibald Alexander, used to send his preacher boys out after they graduated with this council, make much of the blood of Jesus in your ministry. And the way to know how much God loves you is by making much of the blood of Jesus. It is God's open declaration that He loves you. You can say, Christ loved me and gave Himself for me. And Christ's love is a reflection of the Father's love. And then the Father loves you the way He loves Jesus, practically. Fathers have Christmas tree hearts, don't they? David Martin Lloyd-Jones, my favorite preacher. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, his daughter Elizabeth had a habit or a, a hobby back when she was a, a young girl of collecting movie star picture cards from cigarette packages. And she had captured and caught every one of them that she wanted with the exception of one, Norma Shearer. And Lloyd-Jones was away preaching on one occasion and... He goes out for a meal after they're sitting there and the meal's over and the man pulls out a package of cigarettes and lights up and Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, does that package of cigarettes have a card on it? He says, yes. May I see it? Of course. He passes it along to Lloyd-Jones and you know, as Presbyterians, we would say as luck would have it. It was Norma Shearer. And Lloyd-Jones says, may I have this? So Lloyd-Jones goes home and he puts the picture on the breakfast table for Elizabeth to find when she got there. Now, what, what is that? That's a father's love. Fathers have Christmas tree hearts. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Jesus found the Father providing every single thing that He needed. Again, one simple example. He is deserted. He turns to those who are deserting Him and He says, You need to understand something. You may leave me. The Father will never leave me. And if I wish, I could have a SWAT team of angels that would handle this like that. What's going on? The Father was providing. Think of how many prayers have been answered. Think of how many temptations you have overcome. Think of how many trials you have borne. Think of how the Father's fingerprints are on the totality of your existence. And over and over and over, He says, I am a very present help in trouble. What is that? Four, five, three, wherever we are. Let's, let's get a couple more in the interest of time. The Father loves you all of the ways about which I have spoken. But He also loves you enduringly. Walt Disney had a word called stick to it -y. stick to it was Disney's word for not giving up. I don't know if you know Disney's story. He lost a truckload of money before he finally hit it big. And the word he coined to share what had happened to him was this word stick to it -y. And he was constantly telling people, you need stick to it -y. You need to stick. It's, it's a synonym for the biblical word endurance. a synonym for the biblical word of perseverance. Think of how the Father stuck with the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of how the Father's love never left the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when He is on the cross, listen now, and the dark eclipse of wrath occurs as the moon of justice comes before the sunlight of the Father's love. That sunlight is still there. And the Father is still passionately loving this Son whom He is now punishing for others. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, will you listen? I've done this too much not to know that when I stand before a congregation like this, that there are all kinds of things going on. There used to be a television program in, uh, about detectives in New York, and it said, there are a million stories in New York. I think there are. 
You may have come here and you have not opened your Bible in six weeks. You may have come here and were you to try to get the door open to your prayer closet, the hinges would squeak so much because they're rusted. You need a battering ram to open the thing. You may have come here having just fallen into that sin that gets you down and drags you into the mire again and again and again. And you're sitting here and Satan is saying to you, that's it. He's had enough. He's washed his hands up. And I'm here to tell you on the basis of the Word of God that is a lie from the pit of hell. And if you will come back this morning, He will welcome you. He'll welcome you the way the prodigal's father welcomed him. He'll have a banquet for you. He'll restore you to fellowship with Himself. He'll cause the bones that have been broken to rejoice because He loves you. And nothing can separate you from His love for you in Jesus Christ. Well, let me give you one or two more, and then we'll stop. The Father loves you, listen now, glorifyingly. Glorifying. I know I'm making up a word. That's okay. I guess my Humpty Dumpty said when I use a word, it means whatever I want. I'll make up whatever words I want. Hang with me. Will you look at me? C.S. Lewis says that every human being we meet needs to be treated with respect because one day that human being will be a monster of such epic proportions you will wish to run from them or someone of such beauty that you will want to bow and worship. I'm going to have a fairy tale ending that is not a fairy tale. And so are you. Jesus had a fairy tale ending. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He's exalted into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. Before him every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And scripture says that God's love for me is of such magnitude that the day is going to come when I am perfectly and permanently like the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I am perfectly and permanently like him, every tear is going to be wiped away. That's why John prays at the end of his strange book, the book of Revelation. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I, I don't want to die. You want to die? I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm tell you truthfully, I told some people this yesterday. I'm like the comedian Woody Allen. Woody Allen said, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. But if I die, I'm going to glory, and then I'm coming back with Jesus, and I'm going to be given a perfect body, and I'm going to dwell on the new earth for all eternity. Why? Because God loves me. One last one. One place where God's love for you is different from God's love for Jesus. The only place. He loves you sovereignly. What does that mean? He didn't have to love you. He did not have to love you. It, if that thought captured us, it, 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 it would change us. Why does the Father love you? We are of the same lump. He loved you because of His own free will. He loved you not because of you. He loved you in spite of you. You remember the old hymn, Why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come? Twas the same love that spread the feast that sweetly drew me in. Else I would have refused to come and perished in my sin. Now, that's what election is. Election is God saying, I love you, and I love you because I want to love you <laughs> for no other reason. I, I, I have to move on. Uh, stick with me now. If you're going to become a grace-focused optimist, you need to learn to focus on grace. I'm saying to you, a good place to start is by focusing on the Father's love for you in Jesus Christ, focusing on the fact that the Father loves you as much as He loves Jesus. Now, how do you do that? Two very practical things. Listen now. You change your self-talk. You, around other people, may be as quiet as a graveyard at 4 o'clock in the morning. But there's someone you talk to as much as teenagers in love text each other. And that's you. You are talking to yourself from the time you get up until the time you go to bed. 
So you need to understand that one place to change your life is right here in how you talk to yourself. Which means what? Will you listen? You have no business in the name of truth. Strong enough for you? To describe yourself as nothing but a miserable sinner. You do not find that in the New Testament. Are you a sinner? Yes. Does your sin make you miserable? Yes. But that's not your identity in Jesus Christ. You have no business running around with this seemingly pious attitude, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Are you a sinner saved by grace? Yes. But that is not all that you are. How does Scripture address you? Will you listen? As a saint. I, I've been trying to get Sue Chase to call me St. Charlie for 50 years. But that's how Scripture talks to you. It calls you a prophet, calls you a priest, calls you a king, calls you an heir. You need to stop talking to yourself as though you were still a pagan, still in Adam. And you need to begin talking to yourself as who and what you are. You are a man or a woman in Christ. And because you are a man or a woman in Christ, your core identity is this. Your father is very, very fond of you. Oh, thank you, brother. So how do you do that? You've got to change your habit of self-talk. I'm going to run over a little bit of time. Stick with me. I coach girls basketball. I, look, you, you, you want to get sanctification? You go coach girls basketball. Man, it, 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 it will accelerate your sanctification. One of the things I learned very early is if you have a basketball team who's not been taught fundamentals, you've you got to teach them. They have bad habits. So I'm going to give you an example. Move this over here. I hope you can hear me. I had these girls, the ball would be shot. This So what was going on? Under stress, you're going to revert to whatever habit you have. This just a fact of life. So I had to replace the bad habit of with the good habit, which is what? I'm getting kind of graphic right here. I'm a coach. How do you block out? You step between their legs. You put a certain part of your anatomy into a certain part of their anatomy, and you get your hands up. And if they get around you, you can expect a horn to blow because you're coming to sit right next to Coach Chase. And I drilled that and 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 drilled that until the time came, in stress, the ball was shot, all five of mine are like this. And we went 27 and 4 and won a state championship. And I had coach after coach after coach say two things to me. Coach, your girls are really fun to watch. And they play fundamental basketball. Why? Because I understood all and you only change habit by intentionally seeking to change it. Listen now. And by repeating it and 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 repeating it, and repeating it until the new habit becomes your default habit and it becomes second nature. So how do you do that with this? You wake up in the morning and you say, whatever else is going on, my father is very, very fond of me. You go through the day and you say, my father is very, very fond of me. You start thinking about yourself. My father loves me. He loves me the way he loves the Lord Jesus. You are constantly preaching to yourself that the father is fond of you. And you'll find statistics vary, 21 days, 3 months. You'll find that as you speak to yourself that way and think of yourself that way, it becomes second nature. And you begin living as a grace focused optimist. So I end with this. My favorite actor is Humphrey Bogart. And one of my favorite movies by Bogart is called Casablanca. Casablanca is a story about a jaded idealist who's living in Casablanca. He has his own nightclub, Rick's American, Cafe American. The Nazis have come in. The only way out of Casablanca is with a, an exit visa. The only way you get an exit visa is from the prefect of police. And the prefect of police, I'll be say this carefully, was
was a womanizer. You got the point. A young couple want to get out. The wife is so alive. She agrees to do so, and then she has second thoughts, and she goes to see Rick. She sits down with Rick, and she says, well, sure, you're a man of the world. You understand these things. What would you do if a woman loved you so much, she did something that would hurt you? Did it because she loves you. My husband is such a boy. I don't think he will understand. until the time you go to bed is one thing and one thing only. You ready? Ah, my father is very, very fond of me. God bless you for Jesus' sake. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I pray that you'll take these words, help us to see, to, just to take baby steps toward grace-focused optimism, to take this one thought that we ought to be optimistic because you love us the way you love Jesus and to talk to ourselves that way and to keep talking to ourselves that way until our basic way of thinking about ourselves is this. I am Charlie Chase. Ah, my father is very, very fond of me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.